Welcome to, well, first of all, Happy New Year 2021. It's here. So today we have live coffee talk and I am thrilled to bring you our first honorable speaker. And first of all, uh, let's go back a little bit. This is live coffee talk. I'm Michelle Kui. I'm a confidence and leadership coach. And you are watching this because I have a mission to bring inspiration, love, and connection to the world. So this is a coffee show where I bring guests from all walks of life to share their story, to share their journey, how they got here, and what struggle they had to face and overcome in order to become the person they are today. And today, joining me is Charlotte Noggle. Charlotte has been a Toastmaster since 2004, and she belongs to two clubs, and she has served in all club officer positions. She has chaired Toastmaster Leadership uh, Institute multiple times. She received her Distinguished Toastmasters Award in July 2014, and her qualification um, as a Qualified Speaker Award in November 2015. Charlotte has been an educator, teacher, principal, and university professor, both here and abroad. She received her PhD in conflict management. She has also lived in four countries abroad with her military husband and family. She just returned, she returned uh, uh, years ago from living eight years in Cairo, Egypt. Charlotte had served in different capacity with volunteer organization and Without further ado, let's bring on Charlotte. By the way, Charlotte's hobby includes playing piano, reading, writing, speaking, and she really enjoys sailing, diving, swimming, and traveling. As you can tell, she has a, quite a personality. So joining me with a warm welcome, Charlotte Nagel. Oh, Michelle. good morning. Hi, Michelle. It's so great to be with you this morning. Look it's at so all of this wonderful new year and where we're headed. I'm so excited because there's so much opportunity out there of how we're going to fill the year. Right. I, I think one of the things that a lot of people are looking for is the change that's from 2020 to 2021. And people are ready to move on to have something, try something new. And I'm so glad that you are here this morning because we connected through Toastmasters and I've heard you speaking and you're a great speaker and you're so inspiring. So I, when I was uh, looking to book more uh, guest speaker, the, you, you, were, you were there for me. <laughs> oh, great. Well, I'm glad to hear that. So Charlotte, tell us about your story. Like, how did you, how did you get into conflict management and how did you, what inspires you to be a speaker? Well, my life has taken lots of twists and turns. I was local in the Inland Empire area as a teacher with a military husband who would, I would take off and go with him for two or three years. And then I'd come back and my school district always let me return whenever I was back. Mm -hmm. And I was, I worked under a number of principals. And of course, I am an adventure, adventurous type of person. So I would watch how they would do all these things. And then I said, I want to do that job. And mm -hmm. I think I can do that job better than what they're doing that job. Mm -hmm. So I decided then to go back and get my degree for being a principal. I had taught K to 12 uh, in the 22 years I taught and then decided to move on up as a principal. And I had the opportunity to experience teaching at both, I mean, a uh, principal at both an elementary level, middle school, and a high school. Mm -hmm. So while I was at the high school, prior to the Columbine situation, I had a father that happened to come on the campus to get his, his son. 
and another gang member from the area happened to be on the campus at the time. And this father was shot and killed on my campus. And it was it was probably one of the biggest shocks I've ever had to deal with. Um, and I've I've been in I've worked in areas where people have very different values than I had, but it was always a challenge. And I loved working with people who didn't always have a chance to do what they would like to do. So in working in that situation, I had nightmares for several weeks mm -hmm. and I didn't know quite what to do about it. So I happened to call the uh, CDC mm -hmm. because they had a violence prevention department. And so upon calling them, I asked for help. And they sent a team of three people to my area, to my district and my community. And they worked with me. Uh, and then I also had some of the University of Arizona people who were doing research at that time on conflict. Uh, and they came and uh, assisted me, worked with parents, we worked with children. Well, I was in the middle of my PhD program to become a superintendent. Mm -hmm. That had been my goal for most of my life to be a superintendent of a school district. Well, this changed my life. Absolutely. I decided I did not want to go on. I wanted to really spend some time working in this area. The other part of it was I wanted to help learn why young people were not able to use their language to tell us what they were having difficulties with. Young, young people tend to keep their thoughts to themselves and you, you know something's wrong or they're feeling a certain way, but they don't have the vocabulary or the words to speak it. And so I really wanted to work with that. So I began working with youth that were incarcerated and looking at what can we do to help. So then I decided to um, change my PhD and go into conflict management, but it was dealing also with peace studies because I really believe in creating peace. I want to live in peace. I want to have, I can have chaos going on all around me. Mm -hmm. but enjoy the peace that where, where I am. And so I wanted that for other people as well. So that's when I decided. And I went to a school that uh, in, the, in England that had a particular violence program that, uh, so that's how I came, decided to go into conflict management. And ever since then I've been working I have worked with restorative justice in the Inland Empire, worked with the Sheriff's Department. I've worked with creating peace building schools in the Inland Empire that I love doing, it, teaching kids how to refrain from bullying, how to do all those kinds of negative aspects. Mm -hmm. And then um, I decided, I retired and decided to go to Egypt. So that's another whole story. But that's how I got into conflict management. And I'm still using it with teaching people how to, how to resolve their conflicts or how to even fix it so they, are, they don't get into a bad conflict with mm -hmm. how to sidestep it. So there's so many elements to, to what you have just shared. Um, a couple of things that I, I think I wanted to approach it from the personal perspective and also your professional perspective. Personally, you know, you were you were just stepping into the role as a principal, a new a whole brand new principal. And here you are, you know, they're shooting at your on your campus and someone actually one of the students actually died. And that in itself, not just the emotional internal conflict that you're dealing with in yourself you're also um you know dealing with all these emotion coming and, from everywhere and children and children 
dealing right. with and but they were used to it the thing that i found to be interesting was the fact that they didn't drop when they heard shell it were shots it was just like it was routine to them and i remember thinking oh my goodness what is this um i i i had to really spend some time finding out from them and the community why it was not why they didn't react mm -hmm. well they were used to it there was lots of gang activity in my community and so i spent a lot of time just talking with kids brought in counselors i had several counselors that came in and so um but i had to get myself grounded because you can't lead if you are in chaos yourself so it took me about a month to really get myself grounded in what i needed to do it was a new learning experience and a very uncomfortable one and one that i wanted to heal i wanted to fix everything and i couldn't um, mm -hmm. had to fix me first so I, I love how you're fixing you're putting yourself as a priority person and one thing i really love what you just said is that you can't have chaos within yourself and lead you have to keep yourself grounded in order to you know have a have a whole have a control of the situation right. um you know this is something that yeah. you know, i company. truly believe you can't give away something you don't have so you have to really know where you are and what you need and satisfy that in order to give it away mm -hmm. so with that I, I like to transition to like your professional role at that time because then as you're talking to these kids you're, you're talking to the parents and realizing that this is this is the norm for them what what have you noticed the biggest difference in terms of how people are communicating and expressing themselves then or now then oh yeah uh very shy not wanting to speak up uh reserved holding back it was um i had to initiate lots of conversation parents came to lots of parent meetings we talked about how to stop bullying mm -hmm. uh i i put in lots of strategies we worked through uh with the team that had come to help us to build a strategies that were actually incorporated into the school um they we were called a peace building school and at that time the university of arizona was working to uh deal with a peace building program so i had the opportunity to work with that group and bring those peace building strategies to my school and then i moved out into the community because then i also moved out into other schools uh in the inland empire mm -hmm. as the peace lady it was kind of fun it was neat <laughs> <laughs> you are the peace lady <laughs> thank you like even now every time we have a meeting we have uh you know uh, committee meetings you're always the one who's creating peace <laughs> Yes, I try. I don't I don't want my life to be in shambles. I just don't mm -hmm. want it. So yeah. So so that's move forward to now. As as we look around, there's a lot of conflict going on. There's a lot of chaos. Lots. Yes. <laughs> yes. Lots. What we are de we're definitely in a time that we need to be looking to doing and behaving differently yeah so so without going into the politics you know I'm, I'm interested to hear what 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 is your thoughts on in terms of the conflict that we're facing now whether it's internal or external well i think it's both i think the tension is high i think people are fearful i believe much of as i go out into my community uh people are there's lots of tension people are short they are curt they forget 
about themselves because they're dealing with a lot of emotion and a lot of feelings themselves. I don't think lots of people have outlets. Fortunately, my faith helps to do that. I, I have a very strong faith and I stay grounded in that. And I feel that many people, they don't have the strategies or know what to do with the feelings they have. So I encourage lots of people to journal. One of the things that helped me in de dealing with many things that I dealt with was to journal. And I did stream of consciousness journaling every day. I've done it for approximately 15 years now, where I spend a half hour writing three handwritten pages of whatever is on mind. So it's almost like I'm using my journaling as a dumping ground out of my brain so that I have more room for creative and positive things. So that's been a strategy that I encourage lots of people to do. It has worked beautifully for me. I also believe that you have to feel, you have to have a, a feeling that you are okay no matter what happens to you and i believe that working with someone else having a mentor having a sponsor have somebody that cares about you or that you care about them so that you have somebody to share because we are very social animals and when it comes to this time now oh my goodness, we are having to isolate. Even I have had to isolate and I, I'm not an isolated person, but I have learned to find things in my isolation. I read things about women who have overcome obstacles, strong ones. Um, I've also, again, I continue to journal Toastmasters Zooming is new for me. So I love practicing and doing all these, using all these different features of Zoom. So I'm always keeping my mind moving forward. I believe that uh, we have to have an open mind. We have to have an open heart and we have to have a willing set of courage to move forward because it's not easy. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I love the journaling part because I'm, I'm a big um, an addict. <laughs> I would say addict. I have this addiction to journal. So I have tons of uh, notebooks just sitting yes, around. Right. I do mm -hmm. journaling a lot. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And I also found it very helpful, especially when it comes to having an outlet to our emotion. Because sometimes, you know, we don't feel comfortable talking to another person. And like journaling is a great way of keeping it in a secret place. And only you can go back to read it. Only you know what you wrote. And, and it's a great emotional outlet. And I'll probably have my, I will have a burning ceremony sometime and burn all my, my journals before I pass on. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, Although I, I don't know, sometimes people make money based on all those writings they have done. Right. So my and, family may want to look at them. And, and you have such a great experience, you know, coming this far. And I, I'm sure, you know, you it's really, really um insightful. And and I'm sure a lot of people can learn from your experience, mm -hmm. not just. Uh, professionally, but also on a personal level, I, I think you can provide so much value to a lot of people. Thank you. I hope I do. And you know, when you reach this side of life, you have lots of wisdom. There's been lots of things traveling in countries, living in Egypt was one of the most delightful aspects of my life. I got to teach at Cairo University as and most Americans do not have that opportunity. I I just fell in love with the people and they treated me and I just had one adventure after another and had the opportunity to work with Arab and Jewish 
youth for conflict management aspects as well there. Mm -hmm. Youth camps were fun to do. Um, so tell I us just, about tell us about Egypt. Tell us about your experience in Egypt. Oh, well, I decided I had planned to go to Spain because my husband, I was tired. I needed an adventure. I needed something exciting in my life. And so I decided to go live in Spain, but uh, because we had lived there before, my husband and I, when he was stationed there, but then something in my head, I received a message and said, no, Egypt is where you need to go. And I decided to just sell my house, pack up, and I took four suitcases and just decided to go on an adventure. How old and were you when you did that? 67. No. Yes. <laughs> you you sold your house and you pack everything. Uh -huh. I gave all my furniture and things to my grandkids and said, no, I'm packing. I took four suitcases and um, flew, landed in Egypt. The minute that my foot set on the ground, it was like, oh, I think I'm home. It was a wonderful, comfortable feeling going there. And I had the most fabulous experiences for eight years. I am so grateful that I followed my heart and said, okay, I have to go to Egypt to see what's there. And had a house right on the Nile. It was wonderful. I, I, everything was, uh, I just learned a whole new language. I started speaking Arabic right away took classes the whole eight years I was there and had lots of fun trying to pass myself off as an Egyptian, but it didn't work well because I had Arabic with an American accent, they told me. <laughs> but You weren't doing uh, a great job in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. They, they loved helping me. They loved, uh, but I loved them. And so it was just a, a wonderful, wonderful time uh, learning their culture, learning their religion, learning their ways of doing things. And uh, the Middle East has always been a hot spot. But I just think we don't always understand each other. And it was an opportunity for me to just live as an Egyptian for eight years. It was fabulous. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people who hasn't had the opportunity to travel or to experience a different language or different culture, there's a lot of uh, underlying uh, beliefs we have about yeah. another culture and another, another community. Um, mm -hmm. did, you, did you have that before you go to uh, Egypt? Well, I had lived in other foreign countries prior to that. The first country my husband and I were stationed in was Kenitra, Morocco. And we were just outside of Rabat. And I was a young married woman, um, young. Um, I don't remember exactly how old I was, but I had two children then, small kids, and we went and I remember the adjustment of the hearing, again, a French type uh, Arabic. They, sp they didn't speak the same Arabic that other Middle Easterns do, um, but it was very strange for me. I had a very difficult time adjusting. It was the first time um, my family wasn't around me and uh, learning to drive in a foreign country and getting around and doing things. Although I have taught in every look, every place we've ever been stationed. And so I've had the privilege of getting to know people right away, live, working both locally and on the military base where we were stationed. Mm -hmm. So I have had a lot of experience. Living in Spain was very different from Morocco. And so, and of course, Egypt then, uh, because I had lived in many other places, uh, it was easy for me to assimilate quickly. 
mm-hmm. into Egyptian life because I loved it. The thing that I remember the most about that was um, I, as soon as I knew, decided I was going to Egypt, I went out and bought a bunch of travel books. And of course, that's the first thing you do when you go travel, you, you go get travel books and you read Fodder's book and see all of what you need to do. And one of the things that they had said in this Fodder's book was that you were to wear, as a woman, you were to wear sunglasses. You were never to look an Egyptian person in the eye. So I went out and bought these nice sunglasses so that I could wear whenever I was in walking in town or around town. And then I realized that that was not true. <laughs> and so it was like, all of a sudden, many of these things that they had said you had to do just didn't happen. And so, uh, uh, it, it, you can't always go by what you read about another culture. It helps to kind of get a feel, but things are changing so rapidly in the countries that you live in. People change constantly that it's very difficult for those travel books to keep up with what, at least what I found. So I just threw those books away and I wrote, I wrote a journal the first year I was there of every accomplishment I made. It was fun to keep track of that, of just going one block out of the hotel or the apartment that I, I eventually moved into an apartment. But um, I remember going one block and turning around, coming back, and then going two blocks the next day and turning around and coming back. And so I just ventured out further and further as each day went on, meeting people, talking with people, going into shops. It didn't take me long to get acquainted with people, so. Wow. <laughs> I, I wish I had met you uh, 20, 15, yeah. 20 years ago when I first came to the country, because that's how I felt. Like everything didn't go right. You know, as an immigrant, it was really hard to adjust to a foreign country. And the older we get, it takes a lot more time and a lot more obstacles to overcome in order to feel, you know, adjusted to, to a new Well, culture. and I found that when I came back to the United States after being there for eight years. I found America way too fast. The pace was way too fast compared to what I had been used to. Things were much more expensive here than they were there. There was a lot of adjustments in terms of just people talking with. I was used to people saying hi, regardless whether they knew me or not. When I came back to America, I didn't find that when I was out with people. They were very much in just to themselves. And I miss that. I, I miss it. I still find people not as friendly. But the times are not always the best now. So mm-hmm. one one thing I would say that um, about what we're experiencing right now or you know throughout the years is that things doesn't become personal until it's personal. And I think what you have just shared is really the word empathy came to my mind. So, Absolutely. So, so if we can have more empathy in the society, then we can relate our own experience to someone else's experience. You went to Cairo, so, so you know that experience as an immigrant coming to a foreign place, what it feels like to, to face those obstacles, to be having people short on you or turn on you, you know? So, so I think it's a great um, reminder for everyone to practice empathy. Well, then I also had the opportunity to live there during the Arab Spring. So I watched that whole country, the whole Middle East, but particularly Egypt, just go up. Um, I, I, I remember being very curious as to how all these young people could revolt against their dictator um, Ho- uh, Bamarik, who was the president at that time. And I watched that whole for six days. I lived in that environment with chaos going on and 
burning and shooting and all kinds of chaos uh, with the revolution. And then the embassy told me, called me and said that they could not guarantee my safety. So I needed to come home. So I caught a plane the next day, but it's really, and then I went back two months later after things had calmed down, but things were not better. They were a little more settled, but, but I watched people go through wanting something so badly, wanting their freedom, wanting more human rights and not getting it. And so it, that has affected me very much about, I remember coming home after the Arab Spring had started and wondering to myself if I was willing to die for my country mm -hmm. to keep my, our freedoms. And that's been, a, that's been something that I never cared about before. I never thought about it before. But once they become a part of your experience and your awareness, you're much more aware about that. So that's helped me get through some of the chaos that has happened in our country now. So, <clears throat> Shalia, I wanted to, I, I, I wish I don't have a time limit and we can talk on forever. <laughs> <laughs> but I, because you, you have so much wisdom and this is the main reason why I wanted to bring you onto the show, because I think you can provide so much value to what we're experiencing, not just in our personal life, but also our, our just in this world, period. So I kind of wanted to wrap up by asking you, you know, if there's any message that you would like to share with the audience today, what would that be? Oh, yeah, I think I said that just a few minutes ago. Yeah. I want people to trust, to have an open mind, be ready to take in new opportunities with new eyes, see things differently than what you see them now. Keep your mind open, keep awareness of what's happening around you, have an open heart. The compassion, the empathy is absolutely what people need now. It's pretty hard though, I think for some people to show empathy if they haven't experienced some of what we're dealing with. But it's important to keep your heart open. And then the last thing is be courageous. Do not hold back. If you feel and you have this impetus that you just need to learn something, try something, find a new job, a new talent that you want to develop, then go for it. Go for it with all the gusto that you can. Because I believe that there are opportunities that people are confronted with and they are missing them. So open your eyes and enjoy the moment, be in the moment. So those are some things that I think are really important, Michelle. I love it. Open mind, having an open mind, be empathetic and have the courage to ask and to do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. It can be done even in this time. We have ways to, to learn new things, take a new class. We have free educational courses online. People can take, I, I, I have two or three classes that I'm taking. I haven't paid a dime for, and I'm so grateful for them. So explore, uh, look around. Yeah, this I is could mention that a number of times. <laughs> This is really truly a great opportunity to to look around and find those um, free resources and talk to people, join groups, and and just connect with each other. And I think you know, virtual world makes it so much easier by just going on to a meeting. Yes, we all get Zoom fatigue, but you know, it's a different type of feeling when you can talk to someone in real time. Right. Yeah. And I think having coffee talks. 
and having happy hours um, and bringing breakfast to your Zoom meeting and eating with someone that's on Zoom with you. Thank God we've got it. I, I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to have it. Yeah. We could be isolated without being able to contact this way. And I'm grateful for, I'm grateful for them. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful that you came to the show today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank Been you so fun. much, Charlotte. Yeah, I, I, yeah, you have shared so much insight. And I hope those who are watching, be sure if this is um, a replay, you comment on the replay and you can always reach out to me or to Charlotte if you have any issues or conflict issues or questions about conflict or how to deal with your personal and, and professional conflicts and how do you work on the leadership skills, then be sure to reach out to us. Will do. Thank you, Yay. Michelle. It's been fun. Thank you so much, Charlotte. And thank you everyone from, from watching. Again, this is a live coffee talk show. We air every Wednesday at eight o'clock Pacific time. So join me next week for another great episode. And if you haven't already done so, be sure to follow me on Facebook at Live Coaching by Elevate. And I will see you all next week. Bye. Bye.